So this will be a quick part one of how to use the chart of the nuclides. And for the nuclear chemistry summer school, since there's a exercise question that I've given with scandium 44M, I'm gonna use this uh, nuclide as our example to go through what you see in the squares on the chart of the nuclides. So of course the primary thing you see is you see the symbol and the mass number in the top of the square. If the square is split like this one is, then the left side represents the metastable state, the right side represents the ground state. This is actually kind of unique in that the metastable state here has a longer half-life than the ground state of this nucleus, of this nuclide. The top left or top right corner, top right if it, the square is not split, is where you would see spin and parity. Those have not really been discussed yet in the class. Those come up with nuclear uh, structure. And those do become important when you think about nuclear decays in terms of what is and is not allowed. You can see several symbols in this square. Several of the symbols might be related to the decay modes. So this metastable state of the scandium 44 decays mostly through isomeric transformation. It can also decay through electron capture. And there are gamma rays energies associated with those decays. The ground state of this nuclide would decay through positron emission or electron capture. And again, you see some gamma rays that are associated with this, transi with this transition. The other information you can get in the square is that the top half of the square, like with the titanium or the scandium here, if it's gray, that's stable. If it's colorless, that means it's a very short half-life, very short here being less than one day. And then the warmer colors, the warmest color, the orange would represent one day to 10 days. Yellow would be 10 to 100 and et cetera. So the longer the half-life, the less radioactive some specific number of atoms will be. And so the cooler those colors become. In the bottom of the squares, one of the interesting things is these neutron absorption cross sections. These are for N gamma reactions. And starting at 10 barns, you have blue in the bottom half. And that color again gets warmer as the N gamma reaction becomes more likely. So the scandium here, this has a neutron absorption cross section of less than 10 barns. This scandium 45 is blue, so its neutron absorption cross section is between 10 and 100. And if you go down the page here just a little bit, and you look at, say, that argon 39, the bottom half there is yellow, so that neutron absorption cross section is actually between 500 and 1,000 barns, just as an example. Some of the other information that's interesting to get from the chart of the nuclides is that on the one side of the chart, you have these fission yields from uranium-235. These are the yields for these isobars. So the yield of mass 92 total, you would expect to get a 92 mass fragment out from fission about 6% of the time. Whereas you would expect to get a mass 95 fragment out from fission about six and a half percent of the time. These nuclides that can be independently produced from fission have these little triangles in the bottom right hand corner of the squares and those colors also in turn correspond to the independent or the individual yields of those nuclides. Again the warmer the color the more likely or the higher the percentages for that yield these black triangles represent an independent yield between 2.5 times 10 to the negative sixth percent and 0.01 percent. And as those triangles get warmer in color, those independent yields of those individual nuclides go up. So if you wanted to look for the products that come in the highest concentrations or highest amounts directly from fission, those are the orange triangles. 
And these are what are formed initially from that fission reaction. So of course, everything that is in an isobar, if it's undergoing beta minus decay, it's gonna work its way up. So everything in this mass 88 isobar is gonna eventually work its way up towards bromine 88, which is itself in turn going to decay to some other mass 88 nuclide. If you follow that beta decay along, this is one, another way you can use the chart, is that beta decay is always going to turn a neutron into a proton. And so you lose a neutron and you gain a proton, so the mass number stays the same, but you're moving up in terms of the elements. You're moving across, left to right on the periodic table. So that mass 88 isobar, for instance, from fission is eventually going to stop with strontium 88, even though strontium 88 with one of those black triangles independently is not produced in a large amount from fission, you would get a decent amount of this strontium isotope coming from fission overall as all of these other nuclides decay along that isobar. Also notice that on the opposite side of this valley of stability, on the proton rich side or neutron poor side, we do not have the triangles associated with fission yields because, simply because, fission is going to produce neutron-rich nuclides. And so you might have an, uh, the occasional independent fission yield somewhere on this side of the valley of stability, but you're not generally going to see that, certainly not it, with high, any kind of a high yield. To close out this video, finally, if we come up and look, take a look at the actinides, we can see that many of these actinides, the uranium isotopes, have pretty large neutron absorption cross-sections. Uh, uranium-237 is orange in the bottom half. That means that's going to have a larger neutron absorption cross-section than the uranium-234 or the 235. In fact, if you look here, you see that it's 400 and 1200 for different parts of neutron absorption where the one represents slow or thermal neutrons, and the other represents neutrons that are coming in the region of higher energies where they have wildly varying probabilities of, of absorption based off of nuclear structure. And that section is commonly called a resonance integral absorption. And so combined, we have about a 1600 barn cross-section here for neutron absorption by uranium-237 compared to down here about 800 for uranium-234 or about 850-ish for uranium-235. Notice also that when it goes down, so here we have 360-ish for the uranium-236. So this is a cooler color in the bottom half. This is 22 for the uranium-239. So one of the neat things you can do with this is you can look at this information, you can look at this chart, and you can think about what happens to nuclides when they gain neutrons. And so uranium-235 is the uranium isotope used in nuclear power, but to get it into the reactor, we typically also have uranium-238 there along with the uranium-235. So natural uranium is gonna contain over 99% uranium-238, even if you enrich the uranium-235 in a nuclear fuel, you're still going to have 90 plus percent of uranium-238 in that nuclear fuel. So the uranium-238 can absorb neutrons. It doesn't have a very high neutron cross-section, but so much of that fuel is uranium-238 that you're really not going to be able to avoid creating some uranium-239. Then you can look at uranium-239, notice that it undergoes beta decay, and that it would beta up to form this neptunium-239. If you're leaving this fuel in a nuclear reactor for a, a decent length of time, then it's likely that this neptunium will build up enough that it can also absorb a uh, neutron, and it could go to the neptunium-240. But it could also undergo beta decay to the plutonium-239. This in turn, the plutonium-239 in a nuclear reactor could absorb another one or two neutrons. 
And depending on what you form through here, these in turn could come up through beta decay to form americium-241. And so with these actinides, these transuranics elements that are beyond uranium, you can use the chart of the nuclides to figure out how they might be made by walking yourself through what kinds of reactions would form them. Then on here to look at alpha decay, you lose two neutrons, you lose uh, you lose two protons and you lose two neutrons. So plutonium-240 would decay to uranium-236. Uranium-238 naturally would decay to thorium-234, which in turn beta decays to productinium-234, which beta decays to uranium-234. So uranium-234 is found naturally, but it's actually a part of the uranium-238 decay chain.